know that this is Good afternoon. It is the middle of August already, like summer. I woke up this morning, stepped outside, and I felt that chill in the air. So, you know, the seasons are beginning to change, and that's okay. So we give thanks to Creator for the gift of an, another day, the gift of an opportunity to be here virtually, to learn, to take in whatever knowledge is being presented this afternoon. We're excited. So welcome to Can Do Links to Learning this Tuesday afternoon. My name is Michelle. I'm joining from a Miskwichi, Wiskaigan. So Edmonton Treaty 6 territory. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to introduce our guest who's joining us from the States. I I think you said Northern Virginia, Chuck. Um, so we welcome you. Um, he's going to talk about job economics, which is this grassroots movement. I don't know about you, but I love grassroots movements. I love those um, movements that are organic, that come from the heart, that come from the vision, the need that's seen within the community and the people and organizations and the economy. So really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions, have any comments at the end, but you know, during today's presentation, feel free to use that chat box. If anything comes to your mind, put in the chat box. I will absolutely make note of it and we will definitely come around to it. So we welcome, welcome, welcome you all. Thanks for joining us. I realize that there's some people who cannot be here, um, but they will catch this. You will catch this on the replay. So I say to you, welcome and thank you for listening. All right. So today's presentation is by Chuck Belmore. Um, with Job Economics. It's an international grassroots movement on four, four continents dedicated to economic, community, small business, and workforce development and un undeserved and under resourced communities. The Job Economics. Nope, the job economics. I was just saying earlier how it's a little bit of a tongue twister there. Um, this webinar will provide. Um, an overview of the Jobonomics movement and its turnkey programs to mass produce startup businesses and careers for Canada's Indigenous communities. So I looked at Chuck's bio and let me just tell you, this gentleman has a lot that he's bringing to the table. Um, just a couple of things about what he, he, so he's the author and founder of Job Economics. Um, it's launched in 2010, garnished widespread support. Um, this grassroots movement reached, check this out, reached an estimated 30 million, 30 million, I was gonna say three, but then I was like, there's a zero at the end. 30 million people via lectures, um, the website, and even an American TV show. So dozens of communities, neighborhoods, cities, and regions in North America, South America, the Middle East, and Africa now have job economics chapters. And you know, this list could go on about what this is all about, what they've been doing, what they've been involved in. Um, and it's just phenomenal. But I'm just gonna pass the virtual mic over to our guest speaker because he will capture this way better than me. And we're here to listen to you and share what you have, uh, what, you, what you're up to, what you're providing to the communities and the cities and organizations. So thank you so much for lending us your very valuable time, Chuck. I'm passing well, thank, you very, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Appreciate the intro and uh, we'll Got a presentation I'll go through very quickly with you, then uh, you can get Elizabeth who will have the copies of the presentation and get it and post it. But I would be remiss if said that my boss is on here, you know, the, the leader of the uh, Jobonomics Canada uh, group, uh, the, uh, and that is Leanne Hackman Carthy. She's uh, sitting there with her uh, Canadian, uh, not quite red, but uh, to say, say hello, uh, Leanne, when you get a chance, or you say now. Um, but hey, I did, you know, she is a very valuable player. And I said, I met Leanne as a side in Washington. She was, we were on the board of the Institute for Sustainable Development. And uh, Leanne is also the CEO of the Economic Development uh, 
Alberta group and had been there for a while. So uh, Can Do is all about economic development. So uh, both of us are, are deeply involved in, in the economic development. Uh, I'm gonna go uh, put up a few slides. I think the share screen is good. Uh, can you see that uh, everybody? That, that's good. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Jobonomics specialized in mass production, startup businesses and jobs. And uh, we're going to talk about what, uh, what Jobonomics is, uh, launching maybe a partnership with Cando, and, uh, and then also implementing a couple of pilot programs. And, uh, and we want to focus, obviously, in this case, on indigenous communities. Uh, I work with the uh, Navajos and the Crows in the United States. So, uh, and uh, now, when I say underserved communities, uh, what I mean by that is they could be poor, they could be minority, they can be under-resourced mo mainly. Uh, and in uh, both indigenous communities, both uh, in the First Nations uh, as well as Native Americans uh, tend to be under-resourced. Under uh, and so they're very interested in, in what we're doing. Uh, so uh, I think you covered this. Uh, I'm an ex-combat fighter pilot, so I don't, my patient's quotient's not very high, uh, but I'm also a dedicated Christian, so I've got a personality conflict. Uh, I've, in my life, i uh, founded uh, hundreds of programs, literally. Well, my biggest program was about 32 billion uh, when I was in the Fortune 50. Uh, I've written about 14 books on economic community workforce development. As Michelle said, we have chapters on four continents. Uh, we got dozens of uh, chapters. U.S. and we've got a, a number of high uh, uh, profile uh, turnkey programs that we're going to uh, address. Uh, I'm not going to go through these are the books. Uh, we published the first book in about 2010. I figured I'd do one. Since I live in the D.C. Metro, Washington, D.C. Metro, we'd go, I figured I'd go to Congress. I had about 30 meetings in Congress. I got nowhere. I got nowhere with the Democrats. I got nowhere with the Republicans because uh, they, they just weren't quite interested in small business approach to economic development. And, uh, and I understand that, you know, small businesses really don't have the resources to pay for the, for the, uh, the political things that uh, go along with being in politics. Uh, I, I assume it's the same in Canada. Uh, but uh, we went to uh, governors then and then to the mayors. But what happened is community leaders started coming. And this is about 2016 when they really started coming. And I said, was first first one was an African American uh, street preacher and guy was running for Congress in uh, in New York City. And, uh, and I said, what, what would you think? Why are you interested in us? He said, Well, to live in Harlem, you got to have a lot of chutzpah. He said, You got to have a lot of hustle. And he says uh, they like the idea of having multiple business startup businesses. And uh, and so. Uh, it, it grew from there, but I won't go through this list of, of books. A lot of the stuff's available on our website. Uh, we are aligned with a Canadian company on the structural viewpoint. It's called Jobonomics Sprung, that Sprung Structures. Uh, these are some of the structures that they have in the First Nations. Uh, you see the, there's a, uh, I'm not going to pronounce the names, but the, the one on the upper left is, uh, a, you know, a resource center, community center, large thing. Then they have a nation rinks and they have a powwow structures, which is really pretty interesting, huge structure. And uh, the one on the lower right is, uh, is American Indian uh, in downtown Taos, uh, New Mexico, a uh, retail store. And just give you some kind of idea of what they're doing. And so when we're doing turnkey programs, you know, people are saying we can use existing buildings and modify existing buildings, but sprung. Uh, these structures go up in weeks, in months, and, uh, they're, and they're, they're very highly deployable. You can use them for different types of uh, activities. And so we they build it, we fill it, and uh, we fill it with jobs and business. So that's how the thing is. And I'm dealing with the, uh, with the CEO uh, level at, at Sprung, and uh, a guy named uh, James Walls is our liaison. I'll give you his name later on. Um, this, this strong structures, I don't want to over advertise these things because you're welcome to use whatever you want. You know, we, we are a, we're neither a nonprofit or a for profit. We're an international grassroots movement. We don't charge for our services. We recommend these things. I'll show you each one of these programs. We have a turnkey uh, business plans. We'll just give it to you. 
Now, if you want us to help you, then, uh, you know, I will, I will turn around and say, hey, Leanne, get online and, you know, go, uh, and, uh, I'm kidding, but uh, Leanne and I will find the right resources. I probably have about, uh, about a thousand people, uh, not to the quality of Leanne, but close uh, that we can deploy uh, against the, uh, to get these things going. But the wow factor, if the two richest men in the world can build their key signature pro programs like the Blue Horizon uh, Origin headquarters, he would, uh, Jeff uh, Bezos just rode the rocket, you know, last month. And uh, that's his headquarters. That's what he's doing for time. Uh, Elon Musk, everybody knows who he is, built the assembly line, third assembly line in three weeks. It's a thousand feet long and 150 feet wide. You can see a picture of it. But he's building all his future structures out of this. So it is to have the wow factor uh, in, uh, in, in, in especially going to, uh, to some of the funding agencies, you know, to like in Ottawa, Toronto, wherever you are, you know, uh, international, and having something that has got a wow factor will, will it's, it's particularly for sponsorships. You know, people want to sponsor something that's really, really pretty good looking. They don't want it just to, uh, you know, a redone uh, warehouse somewhere. You know, and so uh, these are the chapters around the, uh, the country uh, that I had. They're in different states. Uh, economic development. You guys all know economic development. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, it take, it, you, you plant these seeds, you water them, some live, some die, some sprout again. You know, it's just it's especially when you're working in, in depressed communities, because the reason uh, the underserved people, uh, at least in the United States, you know, whether it's uh, Native Americans or minorities in the inner cities, the reason they're poor to a large degree is because they don't understand the language of business. And so that's what we, we do. And we look at small startup businesses. Uh, we're even doing that. Uh, here we have uh, down at the bottom is the Sonoro, Mexico initiative for the uh, the immigration crisis. We've, we're talking to the uh, the governor of Arizona, the governor of Sonora. We have uh, ECOWAS in West Africa. We're working with the Uni of Ife, which is the uh, monarchs, one of the traditional monarchs that has 300 million people. Uh, they're not a. They're this is before the colonial era, uh, and so. The Uni uh, is kind of an interesting guy. They're like 40 years old and uh, he's got like 300 million people in a diaspora and around and not unlike uh, First Nations or the indigenous people, the, the diaspora uh, outside of the uh, reservations is, 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 is an issue. And so what they're saying is, hey, the Uni says, hey, look, let's forget the colonial. Let's get back to the era when we were really, you know, it was our, our golden years in Africa when we had the monarchs up. And the same thing for the Native Americans and uh, First Nations and the Hinduists and the indigenous people back to the back to their to their their days. And uh, so uh, here's a picture of Leanne. Uh, you serve the real one on that picture. We uh, put together a couple of presentations back in 19. I was keynote speaker in the EDA conference. Uh, and the idea is how do we create jobs for everyone? And uh, can we create the future jobs we need? And with all this, it's all available. It's on my website. And uh, Leanne has got a job in Amish Canada on hers. Now, what separates us from, um, from most economic development people is that, and, and I was the keynote speaker for the IEDC, Economic Development Conference and uh, Futures Conference a couple of years ago. And when I told him, I said, look, economic development professionals are taught top down and bottom up. But when they go to work for politicians or they go to work for, you know, uh, in, in, in some economic development uh, areas is that their bosses all want to get a big signature project. They want to they want to emphasize something big, you know, the ribbon cutting ceremony big, uh, whereas they're we tend to focus on the bottoms up. And so the question is, is if you can't track a big macro enterprise, say one hundred million dollars a year type enterprise. We, we, we say, hey, why don't you go ahead and focus on $1,000, $100,000 a year enterprises? And uh, we're really looking at grass producing micro businesses and non employer firms. Now, these are the micro and non are kind of blur the gig economy, freelancers, part time consultants. Now, micro businesses are like one to 19 uh, small businesses, startup. Now, all these big businesses eventually start up. And my wife bought me a new puppy. He was, uh, 
is trying to get to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, she named it Maverick, you know, which is I'm an ex-fighter pilot, so yeah, I might have to let him in. Uh, but a non-employer business is, is, is a business, but not uh, one that has employees. And the United States is 20 million, 77 million of these firms. And uh, that means at least 27 million people uh, that are employed that, and they make more money. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the small non-employer business, they make more money than the, the whole Department of Defense, the, all the government buildings and the state, local and, uh, and, and D.C. job all put together. The non-employer business in the Washington, D.C. metro make more money. Than, than all those people put together. And per capita, the, uh, the, the incorporated business make about 140,000 a year and the unincorporated uh, self-employer businesses, which are many of them are part-time, make an average about 50 or 60,000 a year, which is phenomenal. And they're growing twice as fast. Now, what we, we recommend, uh, to, if we're gonna form a can-do uh, you know, job economics partner that we hold a town hall meeting and we discuss some of our turnkey programs because this gives kind of a list. Uh, we have a controlled environment, agriculture, digital academy and social determinants of health, which I'm gonna recommend as you put it, and I'll talk about this uh, here in a second. But we also have a super oxygenated uh, water manufacturing distribution for in, it does environmental remediation, it does for agriculture, uh, and we have a number, this came out of South America in, uh, in Colombia. They're doing coffee beans and avocados that are coming out the size of, you know, footballs uh, and uh, limes the size of softballs. But anyway, it's just phenomenal with this dissolved oxygen for drinking water. It's being used for the COVID now uh, to help people when you're, when you get Picked up by an ambulance or an EMT group, first thing they do is put an oxygen mask on you. This is the same thing, but delivers through the water into the bloodstream. It's really, and we're looking at a number of places across the states is for, uh, putting this in, in in different startup businesses all around that, and and in uh, indigenous areas uh, in, in uh, Canada it might be. It. We're not talking about this today. I'm just give you highlights. We have a number of waste of value programs. We have an electronic waste of value to go out to retrieve the raw materials in the electronics, like the copper and the aluminum, uh, and the precious metals in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, computer chips uh, and the uh, and the uh, uh, print circuit boards. Uh, we have a plastic, two or three plastics to fuel biofuels, where you take waste plastics and they make a sulfur-free diesel. Uh, for example, that China has stopped taking our waste plastics. If an indigenous uh, larger uh, tribe in, uh, decided that they could they could collect this stuff that used to be exported, uh, they could they could they could turn that into diesel fuel for their for a whole reservation, you know, and that essentially use it to, uh, even for co generation could probably provide free electricity. Uh, uh, renewable energy services we have a. We have uh, some of the leading ones there uh, to do to all those uh, experiential tourism is a big deal. Uh, we'll talk just a little bit. And in the States, we have a veteran owned business program because our veterans uh, have a tremendous amount of borrowing power. A veteran can borrow up to about a million dollars for a fourplex uh, affordable homes. And so that's what we're doing. And a lot of these communities that are underserved. Uh, we get veterans to come back in and then build uh, condos and fourplexes and you know triplexes. Uh, they own one, they rent the other ones out for affordable things, and and it does two things: it does affordable homes, but it also infuses some really good talent back into the neighborhoods. Uh, some of the problems that uh, at least uh, the the Crow Indian Nation in the United States, Chief uh, Cedric Black Eagle, told me he said the biggest problem we have is a brain drain says once they leave the reservation, it's tough to get them back. And, uh, and so the question is, is how do we, how to reverse the flow or keep the kids on in the reservation or on in the communities? And, and that's no different in, uh, in the states and in the inner cities. So if somebody gets, does well, then they move out to the suburbs. And uh, so, but these, we'll go about this. Uh, I've, I've got many more programs, but if we decide to take the next step, we'll go through all of them. But to give you a flair for what we're, we're talking about here is, you know, controlled environment agriculture and micro farms. 
Uh, we have complete business plan. This one here is with uh, I'm the uh, on the advisory board for a thing called Axe Freedom Farms of America. Uh, it's about like a 500 page also. I can get you all that data. The other one is Sprung. Uh, that's uh, they build uh, uh, greenhouses. They started off uh, Sprung in uh, Calgary. Started off in 1887 building tents for the cowboys and the miners. And uh, and then uh, they've gone into. I showed you the pictures of Jeff Files and stuff, but they really got the. Uh, their, their foot very much into the agriculture by uh, with the cannabis industry. And they're growing, so if you can grow cannabis, you can, you can grow high value products, other things, whether it's hemp seedlings or wasabi or, or, or fruit or you know, flowers or, 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 or vegetables. So the one on the left, the green one, they come in, they kind of help you uh, partner with it and they help you do the thing, where the one on the right, the sprung is more of a turnkey We'll build it for you and thing. And, and in, in uh, Alberta, they have a thing called the ARC, which is Advanced Research Center, which you could go to and, and learn uh, how to do, uh, you know, state of the art, uh, uh, especially for the Northern uh, tri areas. Now, controlled environment agriculture is indoor agriculture, but it's growing high value plants and fish. Remember, fish is too, also in uh, with an ideal growing conditions. And uh, they have traditional, we can use soil based here down here, you can see the green one here, that's a soil based system. And these are the fish tanks down here. Or you can do hydroponics growing in uh, plants or aeroponics uh, that delivers, grows plants in the airs and you, you spray mists on them. Uh, agriculture is, aquaculture is fish farming and aquaponics is a combination of using the fish waste to use for the uh, thing. We have all those different kinds of systems that, uh, but we really focus is on, on mass producing jobs and things. Here's uh, obviously the highest value of the culinary and medical herbs. Uh, the uh, wasabi, well, that's this one in the upper right here, is that's a Japanese hot salt. That the, the profit margins of that are, are even better. Uh, uh, it just, it's incredible that, that you can grow. But for, for, for most of the applications we're talking, especially up around the Arctic Circle, the people just need the basic food stuff for, for food, food insecurity. You know, they need the uh, tomatoes and the, and the green lettuce and stuff. And the cost, uh, Leanne and I were talking about uh, Fort McMurray and, you know, in the wintertime, a cost for a grapefruit is, you know, $20 or something. It's something outrageous, you know, and food quality is not all that great. Uh, so, uh, especially for the uh, for the miners that are out, that are out there, uh, this is a you can go to this website. Uh, you, I'll send this briefing to you. This is what we did with Axe Freedom Farms. We designed uh, a twelve thousand acre uh, Freedom Farms for veterans, and that was uh, with uh, we have all the architecture plans. Now, whether you use something like that for uh, one of your communities or not, at least you can use this as a straw man. Uh, to uh, to go to the politicians and and the kind of the people said hey look we can do something like this you know and uh, and and it's about two million square feet uh, two point six of indoor agriculture you got a village hotels farmers markets distribution facilities uh, worship centers community centers and uh, hundreds of single affordable and multifamily homes we got all the plans for this and uh, and you. Now here's what we did. This is one we used for uh, several of our projects in uh, you know, proposing now in, uh, in Jacksonville, uh, no, uh, North Carolina and uh, at Montgomery, Alabama and several other places, uh, Scranton, Pennsylvania. This is a sprung structure. And this is, uh, it looks like a circus tent, but it really is, this is, uh, uh, it's opaque up here. It's a 35,000 square feet that we have have a very a complete business plan. We can give you that's the, that's this business plan I showed you right here. Uh, happy to send to you. Take a look at it. But what it what it we priced out the lower end stuff like uh, leafy greens, rosemary, some vegetables, and some uh, herbs, and then aquaponics. Like uh, we're getting a lot of interest in uh, in Las Vegas now uh, about. Uh, for the casinos, the casinos number one uh, food that they uh, that they want is shrimp, 
because they put the shrimp out there and all the people, you know, they, they, the gamblers go out and grab a, a plate full of shrimp, and, you know, and a cocktail and go back and lose all their money, you know. But, uh, I'll, you know, Canada's got 17 uh, 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 casinos. And uh, I, I think of a lot of our, our First Nations. I'm, I'm not sure who owns the thing. But, you know, growing the shrimp for, for, for these things and, and the fish uh, is, is something of interest. Uh, this is what we're doing in uh, Tyler, Texas. And uh, Tyler, Texas is about, about 100 miles out uh, the east of uh, uh, Fort Worth and Dallas. Uh, you can see this is a, a food desert map. And the orange area is half a mile from the wholesome uh, food and the green areas are uh, more than uh, one mile. And for a lot of the low income people that don't have cars, you know, if, they, if they're more than a mile from a grocery store, or they go to the convenience store, you know, and, and, and eat Twinkies and pizzas. And, um, and, and overweight people in the United States, which has an obesity problem, uh, the principal reason uh, for being overweight is being mal malnourished because uh, you eat the stuff and you just, you, you're still hungry and you eat more and more and more. I mean, you down a bag of chips or, you know, uh, a whole you know, carton of ice cream or whatever. And, uh, and so the idea, there's a lot of things. Now, what we want to do is put this large structure in Tyler and there's an under-resourced area and the little red area here, it's a poor area. It's a, happens to be about 70% Hispanic uh, in that area. So we're working with a lot of the Hispanic leaders. But then out of Tyler, we're gonna move to Shreveport, Dallas, Fort Worth, all around the thing and, uh, and, and supply food for them. And what these micro farms, here's a picture of a micro farm, it's 5,000 square feet. Uh, and I showed you this, got a little fish here, uh, that fish tank that does not fry the ponics in, in, a, in a conventional uh, growing uh, uh, soil-based growing system. Uh, we can, uh, it costs around fully stock, fully operational, about 500,000, but it'll pay itself back in about 3.4 years. Now that's using leafy greens. Now, if I did wasabi or something like that, it'll pay it back in about a year. Uh, but it is, but what they can't sell in these micro farms, they'll, they'll sell back to the, the core, the core group. And that solves the ugly tomato problem. And uh, the ugly tomato problem is the ones you, you can't sell in the farmer's market or nobody's going to pick it up out of, the, out of the grocery store. What do you do with it? Well, you make it into tomato paste, you know, tomato sauce. And so, uh, so that's what this central center uh, does. Now, here's the Canadian food uh, insecurity map that comes out of Statistics Canada. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, the northern provinces, you know, the uh, Navajo and the uh, Northwest Territories and the Yukon uh, have a, a significant food insecurity problem as far as the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the one that's in purple here, uh, the children, almost 80% live in food insecure uh, households. And so putting some of these micro farms or even a bigger one, uh, in, uh, in that, especially in the winter time and that you can use. And, and what we, we're, we're doing in a lot of these things is rather than do it in, uh, in, uh, in Jacksonville and in, in Maysville, uh, in North Carolina, small, we're, we're doing half, uh, a, uh, 5,000 foot indoor agriculture and then the other 5,000 is community center. And, uh, so, uh, it's got a lot of different functions. And so, uh, here's uh, some of the cold weather. This is, I don't know where this is in Canada, uh, but it is in, it's almost in the north. This is a greenhouse. Uh, this is uh, one that used to be in Calgary and they transported it uh, 3,000 miles and into Newfoundland. This is eight acres. And you can see each one of these spines are, uh, are about an acre uh, growing inside. And here's uh, the sprung structure that is up way up here in uh, the, uh, none of, I, I, pronounce, I can't pronounce their names, I'm not uh, a lingo, but uh, uh, up in the Northern area in the uh, Somerset Island, uh, this is the uh, Arctic Watch Wilderness Houses. These are 12 by 12 houses. And if we were had more time and talked about the, uh, uh, the experiential tourism, 
this plus this model would be great uh, to, to, to have each of the uh, tribes and uh, even the different areas to, to go after experiential tourism. Uh, because the millennials are really not interested in going to see things like uh, the Eiffel Tower or, you know, the Parliament Building or, you know, the Washington Monument. They're, they're, they're interested in going and looking at the bears, you know, or the salmon running or the, or the you know, how, how, how the natives live, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and so this experiential tourism is a big deal. And uh, because they're more interested in getting a number of likes in there and, and, and posting this stuff on the, the, on, on the internet. Okay, here's the uh, Digital Academy. I'm just gonna blow through these very, this is a 200, about 160 page plan. Uh, the digital economy is growing about uh, six times, 10 times faster than the economy. And, but in the United States, 60% uh, of all of 67% of our workers are not digital, uh, uh, digitally savvy. Even the youngsters, uh, the digital natives, they're only like 40% uh, uh, have the digital skills, digital literacy that needed to get a job. So that's what we're doing here and in, in on this. Now, only about 24% of the indigenous households have access to high quality uh, internet. Okay, the good news is about 40%, about 44% are living in urban areas so they can get some kind of broadband. Okay, whether they do it at Starbucks or at the church or at the community center. But so we, we work with, uh, and this is some of the work we're doing in Africa is to put uh, remote power, telecom, and internet. Uh, we've got some really good experts about having it. So you get a community center, like I said, if you did half um, 5,000 feet and grow on the indoor and the other half a, a, a digital academy center, they have computers and we have uh, uh, the power and the uh, the satellite communications to do that and fill up with computers for these kids and, and to do that and, and to be able to uh, to really do the training and uh, we can do a lot of the training remotely but when i this is a proposal that we uh, did in uh, for after school care kids now what the kids are all interested in they don't want to be fighter pilots like me anymore. you know what they want to be is youtubers and uh, and uh, and so and if you go TikTok, Instagram, you know, uh, or, or or YouTube, for that matter, it's all about building followings. And you know, for example, uh, and they'll pay you very handsomely. And my two granddaughters who are thirteen, uh, they have followings of about five hundred people. You know, and and so when you get to about a thousand followers, uh, you could you can start monetizing that. And the and in, in the United States, there's $5 billion this year being put out for influence marketing. And what they do is you take a little video and you post it on Instagram and stuff like that. And you, you in one of the, say it's food or apparel or, or sports or whatever the thing is. And you mention a product in, in your little skit or whatever they do. And they'll pay you like 500 bucks, you know. And so the idea is that these kids are in content creation is really a big deal. This creator, creator economy is a big, big deal. And what we do is we teach these kids how to use gaming and whether it's esports and stuff like the, uh, those things is to be able to think about how do you monetize this? And it, it's not that we want to go after being an influenced marketer, but they want to get jobs in those, in those things. And if they have a digital profile and in a, in a, in a, in a digital portfolio, and we make sure that their digital profile is clean, that they didn't say something stupid when they were 13, you know, and, you know, get bumped out of, you know, monster.com or whatever it is when they're, when they're, they're 20. So we clean them up and we get them. And um, the lady that the African-American lady is leading my Los Angeles chapter, he, she incorporated her kids at eight and 10. And that was 10 years ago. They both have enough to go to Ivy League schools. And what they did was they, they, they did little part-time jobs, the, uh, the paper routes or whatever it was, or the holidays, they wanted uh, cash to put in there. They, they got into uh, little investment types of things. So they learned the language of business. And I go back to saying is the poor people are poor because they don't understand the language of business. And the digital economy opens this wide open for remote areas, wide open. There's, this is not bounded by geography. And you ought to get a copy of this digital academy plan and go look at this thing and read it and then decide whether you want to do something. Here is a, an entrepreneur club that we incorporated into our digital academy. We did this about 10 years ago in uh, College Park. 
And you can see these are the young African American kids. You know, they're 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 popping these kind of uh, companies out once a month. And uh, and we have a, a cafe and a co-working space, and the revenues off of that pays for these kids to be able to 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 meet. And what happens is that the cafes and these they they come is entrepreneurs getting together with other entrepreneurs, and they team up, and they motivate each other, and they, and then they spur each other. And they, and and again, you know. Yeah, I'm a I'm a baby bloomer. But if I can be starting businesses and, and, and having a TV show, you you could imagine what these you know the the teenagers can do in the digital economy. Uh, this is a roadmap. We show a roadmap, and it's complicated. I'll give you the, all the data. But this blue line at the top is the toughest one. It's the information security, and these are the three uh, programs in in downtown DC in Anacostia, uh, African American Charter School. And the reason that I say African Americans so much here of my 30 or so chapters, about two thirds of them are African American because they tend to be the most underserved. And I have African American leaders, and obviously that they want to do. So we are getting these kids, you know, after six months, these three little training uh, uh, certifications, they're getting entry level jobs for fifty to sixty thousand dollars without having to go to college, and they could do it remotely. Okay, now that's that's a hard one. Then you got cloud, you got hardware, you got management, storage, web, software, training, and just on the IT stuff uh, or in the uh, cybersecurity, there's the workforce is about a million people, and there's a half a million open jobs, and about a third of those open jobs are entry level, and the entry level can be maintenance or admin or HR, but you have to get these certifications to be able to speak the language that they will hire you. And, and again, a lot of this work is task work. It can be done, you know, you know, in home and uh, especially after the COVID crisis. But we've said, OK, if we're going to build this academy, you might as well build a nice one. And this is one that we're recommending to go. We got it all planned out. It's about 20,000 square feet, paid back period, about two or three years. Federal grants. We got a lot of nice things like that. Federal grants will do this for, for you know, especially for indigenous people. Uh, you know, there's a lot of high priority. But more than that, it's corporate sponsorships. In the United States, there's 10 million open jobs right now. And in fact, most of those, 80% of them are because of lack of digital literacy. So we have some literacy and we start training these people. These corporations are saying, hey, I, I, I want to back that, not only for the PR value, but I want, I want to be first in the line for these kids that are coming out to come work for me. OK, because you're going to polish them all up. You know, you're going to go ahead and do the due diligence and make sure that, you know, they can they can pass a drug test and you know they can they can their social skills are okay and they're certified. Okay, the social determinants of health is the, is the last kind of one I talk about and that is is the newest big thing out here, especially that you know COVID in the United States killed three hundred thirty four uh, four thousand people in America last year, and we're going through three hundred thousand this year. It'll be probably be if the fourth wave and this Delta virus, it'll be about four hundred thousand. So we'll lose more this year than last year. And the ones, the underserved communities, so the ones that are really getting hammered, okay? And uh, same as in Canada, really, you know, they're underserved remote. And so now what we're, not only the COVID's killing the people, it's the, it's the excess deaths that are really gonna soar. And, and that's what the social determinants of health is really about. In other words, drug abuse, mental illness, uh, spousal abuse, uh, uh, delayed hospital visits, they can't get access. All those things are killing people because the environmental conditions are bad. And because in poor communities, they tend to even be more amplified. They, 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 they don't have good access to healthcare or food or education or safe places. So we, we are, from a healthcare perspective, wellness for jobonomics is, is, is a SDOH movement, uh, service of the to health. We have affordable homes. This is the one we are doing in, uh, in, uh, with our veterans to do this. We can uh, work with you and not only your veterans, but for your things. But we're, we can get these housing built in, a, in, a, in an environment where they're doing frame and, uh, and, and a lot of indoor uh, pallet type of things for about a hundred bucks a square feet. And the and these are very nice things and they, they, they could make in, you know, very affordable homes. We have a direct care initiative where we take uh, former women heads of households uh, that you know have two skills. You know they got a maternal skill, 
and they have a household management skill. Those are two, at least they have. And we give them the PDA and then they can do healthcare, social assistance, behavioral care, elder care and child care. And especially for the indigenous people that live in urban areas, especially elder care and the baby boomers, that's a huge, huge business that you know, we can create home-based business or provide in-home care, okay? And uh, behavioral care is gonna be the big one. That includes mental illness, drug abuse, spousal abuse, those types of things, huge demand. And what we do is we, get, we train these people, all these people, as you see here, we give them a PDA and they got these different applications. So if they need to have a telehealth application, they click on one of these. Okay, if they need a Meals on Wheels or a Visiting Angels or, you know, a Zoom uh, legal, you know, they go to those. And so they, they, they're kind of the uh, elder care au pairs where they, they provide that. We can create that. We have uh, online, we have uh, remote uh, uh, clinics. These, this is a clinic that uh, we're putting into, uh, into, into grocery stores, community centers. And so, you know, if you got somebody on drugs, and by the way, the methamphetamine drug rate for the Crow Indian Nation is north of about 65%. Okay, so that is a big problem, you know, the, in, in a lot of the, uh, the areas. And I'm sure that your, your, your native uh, groups are anywhere close to that, you know, because uh, you're probably much more healthier than we are but down south. But uh, the idea is that if you have Cousin Joe that, you know, it's got a, a problem or something, and you, you know, what you want to do, and they agree to go somewhere to get treatment. It's easier to take them down to the corner store, the community center, get them in there and get them. And this is all telehealth. Uh, you can get uh, basic stuff. And actually, you can even put your credit card in there and get the prescription filled right away. You know, so uh, it's very interesting. We offer uh, biomedical labs. This is a big deal. OK, we, for, we can get these in about four months. This comes out of China, actually. And uh, we're working them uh, with diagnostics. And this is what it looks like. And it's uh, it's overpressurized. It's, it burns all the uh, bad stuff and any of this stuff. It's a level two lab. I'll talk about. It. But this thing is what's interesting here. These are called analyzers. These PCR tests where you stick the nose swab up your nose. Okay, it costs about a hundred bucks to process that. And it just takes two or three days to get it. You could do it on there. So rather than you can make this a cost center or a profit center. You put this on some of the uh, inner city areas or some of the tribes, rather than paying somebody else, you know, that are outside the area, you could charge 50 bucks, you know, and this one on the, on the lower right does 30,000 of these a day. And so if you can get the, the no swabs that everybody's doing, you know, they're all collected and they got a process, you can process at 50 bucks, you know, a pop at 30,000 a day, that's a huge amount of out of thing. And you, then you'll have the money to pay for, for all the remote care that we're doing and, and, and testing is going to, is back in now because the, the, the vaccines that we have are only good for like six months. And so they're going to insert some testing and seeing if the vaccines are still good. So we have all the tests that we could help supply. You don't have to use our stuff or the people we recommend, but we know how to, this one down here is really interested. It tells the difference between the flu and COVID. So when the flu season comes, you want to know if you got the flu or COVID. Uh, we have all sorts of other tests that we can do that you could do in these biomedical. And I'm going to probably end with this slide and uh, leave 15 minutes for here is that big push in Canada is for, you know, shelters for the indigenous women and children. And here's a navigation center that's sprung bills and we can get this thing up in a couple of months. Okay. And it's, they're a wonderful facility. And in the United States, we're probably uh, sprung and jobnomics are involved with you know, sprung is probably 20 shelters for homeless. Uh, we just proposed Jobonomics proposed to the uh, Sonora and and uh, and the uh, and the uh, Arizona governors, Sonora, Mexico, to use these navigation centers to process the uh, the immigrants that are coming across. Now, some of the immigrants are going to are going to get turned back because for various reasons. But I said a lot of them, the, the family members, and especially the kids, the unaccompanied kids, and minors, aren't going to get turned back. They're going to get integrated. Now, for the kids that are coming across the board, especially the kids, you know, they're not only having their poor kids that don't have, you know, uh, COVID vaccines, but they don't have measles or polio or whooping cough or any of those other things. And to spread them around the country without having through a navigation center that can do the treatment, 
and uh, do the uh, make sure and then also find them the right foster care and that is is, is what they're using there so so we got the immigration we have the uh, the health care but we're also during like i said for the covid the excess deaths the spouse abuse and, and the child abuse and those things are just soaring now having these kind of things and the uh, the canadian government will pay for that you know, just like that the medicaid will pay for that in the united states tremendous amount of new jobs and you couple that with the remote care that we're doing for the direct care that they can go you know administer and find people under a bridge for the homeless or you know elder or whatever the case may be so the next steps uh we can do this very quickly if you're interested uh michelle uh we'll have another maybe a zoom call uh we uh uh you guys got to discuss whether this is of interest uh, to you uh, and uh, the uh, and uh, and if that will host that town hall meeting with the de decision makers. Uh, if you want to uh, to talk to Leanne, she's on here, and uh, James has just joined us. Uh, James is the uh, uh, sprung liaison, and the brief here is there. Here's their contact for both Leanne and James. Uh, if you want to talk to somebody that's uh, a lot smarter than me, then these are the two people that I recommend. And uh, let me stop at that. So uh, we still left uh, about 11 minutes or so for uh, uh, question and answers, if there is, and if there's not, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, wait to hear back from you. Okay, well, thanks so much, Chuck. You covered, like you, you covered so much ground in this forty-five minutes. Um, so much. It's like, where do I begin? I really appreciate that you you did cover the um, food insecurity and the housing cases and the shelter, um, especially in our indigenous communities. You know, but I live in Edmonton here, and and it's, it's one of the. Um, largest urban indigenous communities here in in Canada and so seeing all of these issues and seeing how it affects our people um, so you covered a lot of ground I really appreciate that um, I did make a couple of notes I was drawing some things down I really appreciated you know the digital economy I think in the last year I really you know everybody was forced to go back to not go back to but to um, you know tune up their um, techno technology, their computer skills, because this was something that I didn't necessarily have to bring into my, my business, but realizing, wow, there's this huge platform, this, there's this huge economy in our digital um, world right now. Even when I went to a powwow a couple of weeks ago to Onion Lake in Saskatchewan, nobody had access to internet and so it'd be great to see you know some some cell towers out there are you know communities investing in that kind of thing so that also reminded me i need to polish up my TikTok, the the potential to build business <laughs> you just mentioned about that um so thank you so much you like i said you covered a lot of ground i have all my notes um here i think the possibilities and the potential and the opportunity and what you have demonstrated what you have talked about just um was a great reminder that there is a lot of opportunity out there so does anybody have any questions comments so patricia in the chat box do you assist nations on accessing the startup great question Elaine, james hop in here uh... Uh, yes, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what the question is. In, in, can you clarify what you're asking? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah thank you. So a lot of our nations, of course, um, I noted um, in the presentation. So, for example, when you're talking about food security, like we can access some dollars through federal funding. So a lot of our nations rely on federal funding over and above their contribution transfer payments. So <clears throat> with the, um, and I know Leanne that you work with our, our First Nations in Canada. Um, so for example, the $500,000 operational in four months. So a lot of times, a lot of times our nations need to access uh, Indigenous Services Canada, they need to access multi-layer um, agreement, contribution funding. Do you help with any of that? 
I, I think, you know, in a case like this, I think it would be important to say, okay, this is the project that makes sense for our community. So say it's food security. And then it's almost like, then you get the business plan together, right? So saying, okay, so this is the project. This is how much it was cost. This is the potential funders and then going after those pots of money. So, I mean, I, I actually know some people who are very good at getting those kinds of projects together. Um, but I, I think what would be more important with what makes sense to your community first, right? What What is the thing that, because you'd hate to put together a project that, that is not sustainable. You want something that makes sense in your context and, and what would that look like? Um, so I guess that would be my answer. Okay, um, I was pretty impressed with the, um return on investment on some of the some of the projects that you came brought forward we are working with a lot of our northern saskatchewan um our, our nations uh, we are doing some projects right now in, in uh, cumberland house um first nation because of, of all the food security food insecurity food sovereignty issues um, some of the projects that we also have looked at are the aquaponic, hydroponic. So we've got some of our nations in Saskatchewan that are doing um, um, like testing, testing. Um, uh, can't remember the name of it right now, but anyway, it's basically uh, doing smaller tests before making the big investments on on bigger bigger projects. So I guess my concern or my question is. Based on what you're stating, um, at the beginning, it was stated that you're not a for-profit or a, that you basically share the information. And then I'm assuming that the businesses that you have aligned yourself with in some respect, is that how you guys, is it, like in terms of bringing these, you know, structures or yeah. opportunities yeah. into nation? Yeah, I've done this for 12 years now and I don't charge, okay? So I've spent millions of dollars. So, you know, they, uh, that's because I'm crazy. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, the, uh, we, we could, just saying, we come in, if you, this is again, a grassroots movement. It's gotta be, I got an international and Leanne's leading the, the, the Alberta thing and we're trying to, and, and James is there as, as part of that in Alberta. Uh, you, you get your group there. We're happy to come up and talk to you. At, we're economic development people. Uh, and uh, the nice thing is, for example, on this indoor agriculture, I'll give you a complete business plan and, 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 uh, and, and James will be there too. And we've got some other people that are Canadian that actually help you to look at it. And, to me, correct me if I'm wrong, James, but you know, I, we're we're talking about the uh, return on investment uh, payoff in about three year, three point four years. But that's that's selling these leafy green stuff. But when you, I mean, when you're charging the cost, you guys are charging during the winter. You know, you know, you know, five bucks for a tomato. You know, it, you know, yeah. you, would, you ought to be able to blow that, those numbers way away. But again, we. We, we, we give you lands right if they, we're done we'll give you the the business plans and you guys can socialize it decide that's what you want to do we'll run the numbers we'll have people help you run the numbers and uh, now I don't take a piece of this you know, obviously if sprung is going to build a facility or you got somebody else uh, uh, yeah. then then you have to work that but uh, but we'll give you the business plans the the digital academy I'll give you the business plan the I mean, the indigenous nation, this, this is right for minorities, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest thing is, is the fact it's the brain drain. When they lose people off the reservation or, or they get into the city, you know, what you want to do is keep them there. And uh, the home-based business, those types of things. The kids love this stuff. Patricia, I guess my question, I mean, I was looking at your profile on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm just getting a better feel for, for your background. In, in your experience, is it food security that would be the number one issue right now? Or what, what would you think uh, in the communities you're working with would, would make the most sense? Well, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. So um, I sit on the Saskatchewan Indigenous Economic Development Network, and I'm also a board member for the Saskatchewan Economic Development Alliance. So we do a lot of um, community with rural um, 
not so much the bigger urban. I um, we work directly with nations. And so food security is an issue in certain locations uh, just due to proximity. But the biggest thing and, and what really attracted me to the, the Jobonomics uh, webinar was um, a lot of our nations will start their own business development corporations. And in that process, they have to find the startup dollars just to sustain themselves. Their, their goal, of course, is own source revenue. So they're now looking at us in terms of saying, okay, how can you help us build a plan? And a lot of times they've been traditionally going to, um, you know, gas and convenience stores. I noted that, um, you know, SEGA and some of the casinos that are in Saskatchewan, there's five First Nations owned uh, casinos here. So a lot of our nations are needing help in terms of where do we invest? Where do we put our dollars? Where do we uh, start looking in terms of business continuity? What are the what are the projections? And so we've been working hard and doing environmental scans, anything from solar to non-renewables and just um, working with the nation specifically in terms of what aligns with their goals. So a lot of times, um, like even with the digital world, um, some of the tribal councils and nations that I've worked with, they created a software testing program and so we know that technology, we know agriculture, and especially this year with um, the drought, um, you know, we've got a lot of farmers, not non-Indigenous and Indigenous that are going to be hurting this, this year. And we know that that's going to affect food security ongoing. COVID, took, we took a big hit with COVID in terms of uh, a lot of our Northern communities were shut down like literally shut down and off because of COVID. Um, they couldn't, they, they, they literally put a Northern border across their province and you couldn't come in or out for food, for water, for anything, for gas, for necessities. And so <clears throat> there's a lot of different, um, different issues, uh, Leanne, in, in each of our individual territories, but food security is one. And the biggest thing is on that, business continuity. Federally, we know that they've just made a commitment in Canada to do 5% of federal procurement. So we always advise our nations in terms of some of that low hanging fruit. And what I liked about uh, listening to your models and, and is that you, you guys, you know, you pay attention and you come up with some solutions and, uh, and you know, this, this is what we, what we think is gonna work and, but we're open to looking at what else needs to be done. So those low hanging fruits, a 5% federal contract. So um, what I liked about the micro, the micro and the non-employer businesses is that <clears throat> these are achievable. Um, a lot of our nations are remote. A lot of our nations don't have access to urban centers. And so uh, we're working hard in this particular province to get broadband going. Um, we know that fiber optics is kind of there and we know that the future of broadband is changing and always evolving and that there's gonna be different digital transformation stuff, you know, maybe one or two years up the line. But for now um, it's fiber optics and so a lot of the groups that I work with um, are looking at those issues so that individuals and individual nations can participate and be viable even with federal procurement. So that's supply chain getting in there. Um, I love the whole shrimp thing in terms of um, the analogy of, you know, like just understanding that there's a need for shrimp, there's a need for wasabi. <laughs> and connecting in terms of what um, like COVID showed like the, the move and the transition or the pivoting to PPE, but uh, PPE is still there. The thing is though that market, same thing with face masks, all that stuff kind of went down where we are now. We don't know if that's gonna rise again, but being able to pivot and being able to answer to those federal, federal procurement opportunities. So we do a lot of advising of First Nations in terms of what opportunities to look at. We do very much similar to what you guys provide in terms of um, sourcing out um, potentials. So when Cumberland House comes to us and says, hey, 
we need some help. We're, we're paying out of the nose for, for the groceries up here. How can we start, um, and again, climate, seasonal, um, how can we start taking care of our own food issues locally for our band members? And you know as well as I do that a lot of our, our nations are, are not big in terms of numbers. When, we, when you look at our on reserve and off reserve numbers, a lot of them are off reserve. Uh, as you stated, moving into bigger centers, urban areas. But for those that are on reserve, you're, you're probably under a thousand per per nation on, on some of our smaller nations. And so, um, so sometimes big isn't always better for us. And, and I apologize that that. But it, it's not about the big. It's about um, you know what's going to work for that. I, I've looked. Uh, we work with Farm Credit Canada. Farm Credit Canada um, is across Canada, but they've got a, a huge agricultural, um, they do financing for agricultural operations. And so they are really looking at um, greenhouse models for nations and not just for food production, but also the medicinal plants and medicinal knowledge. So there's there's all kinds of opportunities, I guess, Leanne, in terms of with nations. So I think you guys hit some of it um, in terms of the food security. The, the waste, like the plastics to biofuels, um, if, you, if you pay attention to the Saskatchewan landscape, um, we've got a couple huge biomass um, production opportunities coming up. And so Meadow Lake Tribal Council is one of them. Um, the city of Melville, uh, Melville is getting into biomass production. So, so when we talk to our individual nations, the biggest thing for us is where those investments are gonna be made, what's gonna give us um, a good return on investment, um, where we're gonna, and that's part of my job, is, is helping nations you know, look at these opportunities. So once this webinar is done and we get the link to it, I'll be sharing it with my, my teammates um, and just see if there's an opportunity for us to, to connect some dots with some of the, whether it's, I like the sprung structures. Um, I think that they're well-made. And uh, I think that um, another company that we work with is more on the modular side. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different opportunities. We're always looking for who those um, core businesses are out there. Part of our responsibility is ensuring that our nation's needs are being met and that they're not being taken advantage of in some respects, that they're gonna have the servicing, that they're gonna have the maintenance. And that's one of the biggest challenges with, with big projects is um, not so much the education or the training, but that is a component of it to get individuals up to speed. So uh, for example, if you're looking at a, a commercial greenhouse, um, you, need, you, know, you need people that can take care of you know, all the computers and, and be on 24 hour notice. And sometimes they can be overwhelming. And a lot of our nations, um, they look at training opportunities and jobs, but they also wanna make sure that that it's not gonna be a fly-by-night company that comes in and swoops in and gets their dollars and swoops out. <laughs> and so those are some of our concerns. And so that's part of my role. I talk less, by the way. Yeah, that's great. great, that's great. Great, great inputs. Uh, thanks, Patricia, for highlighting some of the the issues, the struggles, but also the successes, the potentials and the communities that you were talking about. Um, really appreciate your insight and, and your voice to this topic. Um, so we do have a question and I think it's a really question that can be answered in a short amount of time. This is from Ken. What is the life in years for sprung structures in the north with temperatures down to minus 40 and snow loads? James? Um, I'll take a crack at that. I'm, I'm just typing an email, but I'm not done yet, so might as well be verbal. Um, sprung is a um, privately owned company that's been in business for close to 140 years. I'm based out of um, Calgary or just south of Calgary in Alderside, close to High River. 
and uh, they have currently 13,000 buildings that are up and operational in 100 countries and territories around the world. Um, the life expectancy of the aluminum frame, and it is a modular building, going back to, uh, I believe what Patricia was talking about with the modular company. Um, so they work on um, usually 15 foot lengths and 10 foot increments in, in um, widths from 30 feet to 180 feet. Um, that the um, buildings, um, have a life expectancy with the, with the aluminum of uh, 60 years to 80 years and the membrane that um, runs between beam to beam would have a, um, a guarantee of 12 to 15 years on some and upwards of 25 to 30 with others but um, that membrane is just then uh, replaced without having to disassemble the building after that term. And, um, you know, we can't install the uh, and put up the building in minus 40. So we put it up in the <laughs> in the warmer season. And once it's up, um, it loves the cold weather. Um, it, every building is specifically designed to site. So uh, no collapses. Uh, we meet the Miami Dade Steed um, ratings for hurricanes. So it's a hurricane resistant building. Uh, snow loves because it's designed with its slope angle of 26 degrees. So it sheds snow, which to a degree gives you advantage. You can uh, take that snow and you can um, turn that into uh, water. Um, you should be aware, as you probably already are, is that controlled environment agriculture usually rates between 90 to 92% more efficient and um, well I'll just, I'll just leave it that more efficient than uh, outdoor agriculture you lose you use less water you use less energy um, you can control your environment um, we do have all of the uh, the training and the uh, procedures for helping uh, groups like yourselves get operational get productive we're uh, we have a, a site um, a test facility that Chuck showed that uh, that one in the snow that's uh, now operational near our headquarters just south of Calgary. So we're always researching and developing and improving our, our grow techniques and improving our technology. Do you, James? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Patricia. Yeah, um, so is strong structures, do they ever look, um, like I, I just, I apologize. I, I should have Googled your website um, while we were on the call. Do you mostly focus on food security structures like greenhouses or do you ever do anything like in the green and inclusive community builds? Like do you do zero carbon builds? Yes, we do it all. Um, we built, uh, you know, we, we do, we're working with Chuck in the digital academies. So we do schools, we're just, um, finalizing a contract in Puerto Rico to put up 140 schools that um, were destroyed in the last hurricane. Uh, and my team down in uh, North Carolina is doing a, a one to K school um, in that region. Um, we do, we work in about 20 different vertical industry sectors, right from mining and oil and gas to um, entertainment. We do a lot of casinos with uh, mainly tribes in the, um, in the United States, schools, education, sporting centers, um, net zero buildings. We're doing um, a new project here in Alberta right now on an energy hub and an eco center. So we have uh, mm -hmm. residents in, inside of greenhouses. We got lower level facilities going on. We got uh, upper level greenhouses. Um, we're actually, believe it or not, I have a um, project with the largest Bitcoin mining operation in Texas. We're building them a facility because they're energy hogs and we're helping them and we're doing a big project in Medicine Hat with a, a company and we're going to reduce their energy consumption by 80% as a result of our technologies. Okay. So yes, yes, so, yes, green and efficiency. Good, because um, 
a lot of nations. So what happened federally is they shifted a lot of the community culture bills and they, of course, they got to reduce their carbon footprint. So they've reinvested in, in green and inclusive community bills. Mm -hmm. And so we've got probably multiple nations within our province, which is your neighboring province. Um, and so we know that once that funding comes through, that those, um, that those projects will have to go to uh, tender in terms of who can who can build. And a lot of them are community centers, but they have to be uh, carbon zero or do you guys do retrofits or not? Is it all new builds? Um, well, um, I'll just throw out these two. We just, uh, we've done in the past and we've done, we just, uh, put uh, structures over swimming pools, you know, so the pools have existed, got very limited use, so we put our building right over top. Uh, we have done uh, camps for the oil industry where there could be some uh, some trailers and we just put a, uh, a roof over top of all of it and uh, then add efficiencies within. So it's difficult for us to maybe put uh, our building on top, although I don't know if you're aware, uh, in downtown Calgary at a, um, on top of a, an old, I think, five-story bank building, uh, Brett Wilson put up um, a sprung facility on top of the building called Kaylee's Restaurant. And um, so taking that space the, where there was nothing happening and now is a facility on top. So if that's a retrofit, I guess that is. But, you know, sprung is really an envelope. Uh, one yeah. of the most airtight and efficient um, buildings that um, are on the planet we, we measure high on the uh, on that scale and so um, with our team professional team of architects and engineers we'll take on anything and have a look at it and give your feedback and see if we can help you good no good to know thank you james because we're always looking looking for good good structures <laughs> and, and really if you are. and if you're if you're if you're going further and looking through uh, job and I miss with Chuck and Leanne. Um, don't go to Sprung headquarters, go to us, and then we'll make the links and uh, we'll just give that extra level of service and care and attention that um, we want to bring to you. Okay, thank no, you. Noted. Good, thank you. There we go. Okay, well, we have like surpassed our time limits. Um, oh, I really appreciate and honor everybody for being here. Um, I feel like that this is just the beginning of this um, conversation, to be honest, I think there's so, so many avenues we could discuss, like walk down and discuss, because you've covered so much, Chuck, covered so much, and we really appreciate you lending your valuable time this afternoon. Mm -hmm. well, Leanne um, always tells me I make everybody drink out of a fire hose, and they're just, <laughs> she always smashed me with a rolled up newspaper if she's close, but uh, I can't break my habits, but anyhow, uh, uh -huh. Yeah, the uh, yeah, it was nice talking to you. And if you want to do this again, uh, we got a lot of other things to talk about. Uh, and uh, you know, Patricia, thank you for your your comments. You, it all starts, like I said, you, you have a facility. If you have a business plan and, and a business to go inside it, you know, the uh, chance of you getting funded is a lot higher. And um, yeah. and so and. And it, it's all about the community. Leanne's spot on. If the community doesn't want something, you know, then you like, you can't make a you lead a horse to water. We can't make it drink. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so, uh, but again, I think there's an appetite right now, especially the digital economy. The young kids are interested. They, you know, they. they it, it, so anyway, I don't need to go through all this stuff. But anyway, God bless you guys. Uh, I, I pray that this is uh, something that uh, we can grow some fruit on a mine that we can grow some fruit on and we'll see what happens. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're just honored. We're so grateful for your, the knowledge that you presented and even planting mm -hmm. those seeds. It's about planting those seeds and picking them up. You said in there one takeaway I have, and this is all about um, economic development. How do we create jobs for everyone? And not with, not about us, not about us, without us, not without us, about us. I messed that up. <laughs> but we'll get, every, 
I, I will, anyways, yeah, how I, do you I, create just sent you, I just saved you here. Uh, you know, I sent you the copy, uh, the, uh, and I, I sent one to uh, uh, James, and uh, Leanne had that too. So, perfect. Um, and if you're interested, I can send you other documents, Patricia, on the other programs. Uh, uh, you can go to the website, download. Yeah, I, I, I think I'll connect with Leanne on LinkedIn. And uh, I did see some of the business plans that you presented in your presentation. Um, I would like to see, you know, what else we can talk about. Um, but yeah, looking forward yeah. to it. Thank I'd love you so to much do a jobonomic. I'd love to do a job in I'm Saskatchewan to get these guys in Calgary and Alberta and off the dive, you know, they need to get a little fire underneath them. Yep. No competition yep. never hurts. Awesome. Yeah, I totally All right. agree. <laughs> thank you everyone thank you. again. It's Chuck from Job Anomics. Thank you so much. And thank you for the guest, other guest speakers that you brought on board today too. Um, thank you for joining us. Above all, we are about walking together and collaboration and partnership and making sure that our circle, make sure everybody's strong. Um, so we just thank Creator for the gift of this, this moment and the seeds that were planted here. So thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.